Okay. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's uh, webinar presentation. We are going to be discussing specifically our GAP programs today. Uh, so essentially the topic we're going to cover is the introduction to OptiMed, essentially who OptiMed is, right? But the key focus is going to be on our GAP. So what we're going to do is discuss uh, the group GAP mark medical marketplace, essentially what's going on in group medical at this point. Trends, what employers are looking for, what employees are looking for. We're also going to be looking at uh, what is GAP, its value proposition, what kind of groups are a good fit for GAP, GAP plan designs and options, and then we're also going to get into how to access benefits, and then we'll have a Q&A. So if you have a question, there is a question box uh, that you can type questions into at the end of the presentation. I will try to answer everybody's questions, uh, but we'll do it at the end of the presentation um, once everything's done. Uh, so that's what we're going to be covering today, but specifically, this is all falls into GAP. So who are we? Well, we at OptiMed are a national third-party administrator. That's who we are at our heart. Uh, what we do, though, is we partner with carriers who essentially bring us their paper, and then we market it and brand it under the name of OptiMed. Our TPA side is United Group Programs, uh, not United Healthcare, United Group Programs are not part of UHC. Uh, but OptiMed uh, is our brand name that we go to market with, not United Group Programs. However, if you get a bill from us, you sign up a group with us, the bill will say United Group Programs. So OptiMed is our uh, sort of branding in the marketplace and essentially as a fully insured, as what we do is we take fully insured and self-insured uh, arrangements and we market and administrate them. So we're not a general agent in that we're going out to market and working with like an Aetna or UAC or whoever um, and offering a broad range of different GAP programs. The carrier partners that we have partnered with, essentially that, that to the marketplace, we are just known as OptiMed. That's how the brokers know us. That's how the groups know us. The paper, when they get the policy, may have a carrier name on it. For GAP, we work with four different carrier partners. Some are household names, like Nationwide. Uh, most of the people on this phone call have probably heard of Chubb. Uh, other ones you may not be familiar with or have heard of, but are still great carriers. And we have Fidelity Security Life out of Kansas City, Missouri. And we have Shelter Point uh, Life and Health out of New York. So. Those are our carrier partners that we've teamed up with to market and administrate GAP for. But we also do have other products, which we'll go into a little bit about other products that we have that are a self-funded arrangement. And for those, we have stop loss carriers that we work with as well. Essentially, everything that we do is A-rated or better. When we talk about the scope of OptiMed, we have you know, five life groups all over the country. And we have, you know, large like state government entities like the state of Florida that we administrate a breast and cervical cancer screening program for the state of Florida for underprivileged women. Where we're probably getting at least like 20,000 claims or so annually um, from that program. So if you have a five life group or you have Walmart, there's nothing that we essentially can't handle internally here. Uh, the GAP program that we're gonna talk about today our fit is usually in that five to, I would say, 1,000 uh, marketplace is where we mostly see it. But it can be used in anything, and we'll talk about good groups. Um, and that's one of the topics that we'll get into of who's good fit for GAP. But when we talk about just OptiMed ourselves, everybody kind of says, oh, yeah, we have great, you know, outstanding customer service. We truly do have good customer service here at OptiMed. 80% of the phone calls that we answer are answered within 30 seconds. When you call into our 800 number, there's not a slew of different prompts that somebody has to go through to try to get through to customer service. I mean, there might be one or two, like you're calling for a billing department, you're calling for customer service, you know, you're calling from customer service, what product is it? And then you're put into a queue and they have a live person who answers the phone. So when we talk about customer service for the employee side, they also have a portal. That portal, they can go in, they can create a username or password for themselves, just like they would with a big box uh, carrier on the fully insured side. And they can view their EOBs. When we get a claim, they get a notification via email. 
that, hey, we have a claim for you and we processed it and here's your number and you click on this link and it'll take you to your claim where you can sign in and view. So when it comes to the customer service aspect for the employee, right, we made it very easy for them to access their benefits and to get great customer service. And on the employer side, we do have things like, um, you know, an employer portal that they can view bills, they can do ads and terms, you know, order ID cards. So the technology platforms are there and for both employer and employee. Customer service is there because we don't make them wait through 5 million prompts and then wait, you know, half an hour on the phone just to get a live person. And like 80% of our calls are handled uh, within 30 seconds. Um, and also our claims. We don't do a check run every single, you know, like, oh, yeah, we do a check run once a month. So if you don't make that thing, then uh, we'll pay your claim next month or once a week. I mean, we're doing daily check runs. Uh, clean claims, we're normally processing within about three to five business days. So when it comes to a TPA and getting the service levels that you expect and deserve, the brokers who work with us have worked with us for years. And the reason why they've worked with us for years is they will tell you that our customer service and the last line is your sales representative because we don't want HR burden. You know, you have a sales representative, you can call, get me a name, get me a phone number. I'll have my supervisors and customer service get on it. They'll get a resolve to it, hopefully. You know, some people just, you know, <laughs> you can't make them happy. But essentially, we'll know what the problem is. We'll have the issue. We'll tell them what the problem was. We'll correct the issue if there was an issue. And we'll let you know right away, within like 24 to 40 hours, this has been resolved and this is what happened. So we do have various product lines that we work with. And again, all of the carriers that we work with are A minus rated or better. But when it comes to the products, our four core products are GAP, level funded major medical, self insured major med, MEC. Minimum Essential Coverage Programs, which is a self-funded arrangement and enhanced MEC options. Uh, limited Medical, which is a fully insured program. Uh, and then we have other ancillary products like dental vision, we can do benefit administrative services, uh, critical illness, yeah. accident policies, that type of stuff. Cobra Administration, HSA, HRA Administration. Uh, so here at Apple, we were able to do everything, whether it's just you know, normal, what you would think a TPA could do from, you know, uh, HSA or HRA type of, you know, processing of claims to, you know, setting up a, you know, gap program on a fully insured basis or a major medical. We will have uh, webinars on our major medical programs and our MEC and limited medical programs coming up. So you should see invitations for those. Uh, we're also going to do one on all of our products funded, MAC, limited med, to give you a broad overview. But then there'll be ones like this one today for GAP that you'll see coming up over the next month or so, where they'll be specifically tailored to MEC or limited med. If you have a group that you want us to take a look at for those other products, do not hesitate to reach out to your sales rep after the call. You know, we can talk to you about it. You don't have to wait for the next webinar. If you have a 7-1 group that you'd like to look at a level funded major medical plan for, let us know. So. What's going on in the marketplace right now, as far as group major medical is concerned? And essentially, there's two things that have been going on more specifically, rate increases and higher out-of-pockets for the employee. So when we talk about the trend, the trend has been rate increases, you know, and they, the major medical company, fully insured marketplace can blame it on a lot of different things. But essentially, there have been constant and persistent rate increases in the marketplace especially in the fully insured marketplace over the last several years. And what has happened conversely is that you see now employees going to these higher deductible health plans because of it. So there's less carriers to choose from, which means you can't shop it around. Sometimes on certain states, sure, they might have four or five different carriers in the state. There's some states where it's blue or it's nothing. Or you're very limited. So, with less options to choose from, to you know, to try to shop it around, and with rising rate increases, what are brokers to do? But, but on top of that, you're also seeing as a broker your commissions eroding, 
carriers refusing to pay commissions unless it's you know under a certain size uh having to negotiate your own PEPM out you know with the employer directly so you've seen the broker side have eroding commissions you've seen the employees have to deal with where you know we talk about like 10 15 years ago you know the idea of a $500 deductible $250 deductible with $5 $10 office visit to go pay yeah, those times, I mean, can you even find that? If I was willing to pay the price for it, could you even find a $500 or $250 deductible plan inside a fully insured carrier, like product line? Could you find that with like a $10 office visit or $5 office visit? Okay. You probably could. I mean, that's the problem. You can't even find these great products, even if you wanted to market it. Some states, you can't even get it. A platinum plan nowadays, if they call platinum, is a thousand dollar deductible with like twenty dollar office visit co base that takes you to like a two thousand dollar out of pocket maximum, maybe fifteen hundred. That's a great plan today. That's platinum. So what we're looking at is there's two aspects, really three. What are employers looking for? What are employees looking for? And essentially, what are brokers supposed to do in this marketplace? And right now, what are brokers looking for? So what do employers want? Obviously, they want lower employee costs. They want to spend less, right, on their overall health care costs. But all they also want to do is have higher quality benefits so that they can retain their employees that they value. And they can attract new and better talent. But how are they supposed to do this in this day and age where if you want a platinum plan, the major medical carriers are making groups pay through the nose for it. So essentially because they're paying through the nose for these programs, they've become so unaffordable that groups have had to move to these higher deductible health plans just to be able to keep and continue to offer benefits. So where now your standard plan's got at least 2,000 or $3,000 sometimes in deductible, has out of pockets that range anywhere from like four to seven, eight thousand dollars. The trend to move the health savings accounts, which employees, you know, most employees do not want or like. I mean, sure, in a benefit rich or a, not a, but a, a well off company who, let's say, is a group of uh, engineers, where you got 10 engineers who are making a lot of money, and they look at as their HSA account as a tax deferment for them. Yeah, well, okay, yeah, I can deal with that. I, I have the money, put money, like disposable income to put money into my health savings. But what about the average person who's making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year? Do they have an extra after they paid their premium to put another, you know, two thousand dollars into their health savings account annually? You know, now there's caps on what you can actually even put in. So I come out with a four thousand dollar HSA plan when it's got like a four thousand dollar deductible. And out of pocket of like six thousand, and it's an HSA plan design. I can't even put enough money into my health savings account to cover what my out of pocket. So employees don't necessarily like those types of programs, right? And what is the company also looking for? Not only great benefits, not only lower costs, but they want ease of administration. They don't want to have to, for example, let's say you want to go with an HRA. They don't want to have to administrate that HRA themselves. They don't want to have to start processing receipts and have somebody doing it. Plus, it leaves them open to other things like lawsuits over, you know, privacy or, or HIPAA violations, violating their privacy. And all of a sudden, you find out that I have some health condition or some disease, and now I get fired. Well, that's because I turned in a receipt for my HRA, for my test, for my surgery. And now, all of a sudden, you have lawsuits going. So then, what are you going to do? You have to find a health, you know another administrator, another third party administrator to go ahead and administrate it, then you're paying for that. And then you have swipe cards. But then the other thing is that you have to fund it, right? So they don't want this burden on HR. HR doesn't want to have to go through all this nonsense. They don't want to have to issue COBRA. And that's why COBRA administrators do very well because these groups don't want to have their internal people issuing COBRA notifications. So they don't want burden on HR and having to explain it to people and just having more HR person hiring more HR people. They want less HR people. If you went into a, a, the average size group that has an HR department, 
I, you know, the owner, the CEO of that company is going to say, you know what I need? I would love to hire more HR people. That's the one area I want to spend my money in is hiring more HR. Most companies don't want to invest money into HR. They have it because they need it. Essentially, they don't want to have to have 10 HR people to administrate a group of 100 because it's so complicated and burdensome that they need seven people just to handle their uh, medical stuff. So when we talk about that, right, we also talk about financial stability. So let's say, okay, you can find an HRA administrator and you can get all that accomplished. But what happens with an HRA? Brokers will sell it on the fact that, well, historically speaking, it's going to run at 40%. Okay. But what if it doesn't? Oh, well, got to come up with the money. Well, what if you don't have the money as an employer? What if right now, like we're experiencing right now with record high unemployment, businesses closing their doors left and right, trying to stay afloat, getting federal government money in order to stay and keep open and furlough employees instead of laying them off. And all of a sudden you hit them with this HRA bill for, oh yeah, by the way, uh, you had like four people that went out, three people that went out and, you know, one had an accident, one had a, you know, a child and the other one had that surgery. So guess what? Uh, cough up all this money now to me because I have to pay these claims. Yeah, they want, they, what a CFO wants to know is that if I hire George today, that I know what his benefits are going to cost. If I hire George, it's going to cost me X amount for his major med, X amount for his dental division, and X amount for his ancillary products, like GAP. Not, well, if I hire him in his HRA, is he going to cost me 3000 Is he going to cost me four? Is he going to cost me nothing? I don't know. I have no idea what George is going to cost me with his HRA fund. So financial stability, there's something more financially stable than Pay me this premium every month and it's not going to change. George costs you $50 a month for his employee only rate. There you go. It's $50 a month. So financial stability is something also because they don't want swings, right? We've seen that in the level funded arena, right? Where we see small group now, groups that 10, 15 years ago, if I told a broker that, oh, I, I sell level funded, self-funded major medical programs to groups of 10 and 20, they would look at me like I had 10 heads. Now that's a perfectly, I mean, that is one of the largest growing segments in our industry right now is small group self-funding with reinsurance protection, right? Because why? People have got to be creative. They have to look at alternatives because the fully insured carriers and the small and mid-sized group sizes, they're either not there they're consolidating, so you only got you have limited choices. And what are you going to do? You can come in with an HRA and say, yeah, historically it should be 40%, but the first year it's bad, guess what? They're going to be looking for a new broker. Because I would be, because if you told me it's going to be historically 4% and it's going to be, and it winds up being 70, and I'm struggling right now to keep afloat, and I got to come up with all this extra money because you told me it's 40, but now it comes in at 70, and I have to cough up all this extra money money that I don't have as a company right now, I'm not gonna be happy with my broker. So brokers that can come in with a financially stable product, like level funded products that have all types of reinsurance protection on it so that you don't have to worry, or a fully insured product, like a GAP product that is fully insured. Employees use it, employees don't use it, don't matter. Here's your premium every month. But you need to get start getting creative because there's, if you're not creative, there's other people who are going to be in the industry. And creative is not going in with the same exact thing that every other person has just walked in with. Every other broker agent that has walked into that employer's office goes, all oh, HRA and HSAs, switch from Humana to UHC, UHC to Blue, Blue to the, the, the. I go in and I just say simply, you know what? I'm gonna give you with the same carrier. Oh, and by the way, here's how I'm gonna work your deductible and co-insurance to try to save you money. That's a creative alternative, right? Oh, and by the way, it's financially stable and that it has premium, it's fully insured, it's creative, it has no burden on HR because it has all kinds of technology behind it to use. And essentially it'll give your employees great benefits and it'll lower your costs. It accomplishes all those things that the employer is looking for. But you also have to take into account of what the employees are looking for, right? And what are the employees looking for? Benefits that are fit their needs, right? Which means they're accessible, they're affordable, and they provide meaningful coverage. I don't want to have to worry about a plan 
that if I go out today and I break my leg, that all of a sudden I'm going to owe a three thousand dollar bill because I have a five thousand dollar deductible, and emergency room visits are subjected now to my deductible. I would like meaningful coverage in the sense that if I go out and break my leg today, I don't have to file bankruptcy. And that's the thing is like when you're talking about this, right? It's really just overall lower out of pocket expenses. Because let's say you have the average employee that's making fifty thousand dollars a year. They're paying through their employee contributions through their paycheck for their health insurance, be a hundred, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars a month. Then all of a sudden they go out to try to use those benefits. And the first time they have an accident, they break their leg, they need a stitch, they go to the emergency room and it's a two thousand dollar bill. Which is why we're trying to drive people to urgent care facilities. Don't go to the emergency, go to the urgent care. It's cheaper. But the first time I try to use my benefits, no, I don't want to go to the urgent care. I think I might have really messed my leg up. I want to go to an emergency room. Well, guess what? Here's your three thousand dollar bill. Congratulations. You're talking about somebody, who, an employee, who now ten percent of their income more because that three thousand dollars is not being pre-taxed. That's after tax. So maybe 15, 20% of their income is now out the door for this year through employee contributions and out of pocket expenses because I broke my leg and I went to an emergency. God forbid they actually want to have a child or their spouse wants to have a child and they wind up with a five or $7,000 out of pocket expense. Congratulations on having a baby. Here's $7,000 that you now have to pay day one from the child has been born. So, what we're trying to do with our GAP program, right, is eliminate that fear. Go back, turn the clock back 15, 10 years to when you did have $250, $500 deductibles. You had great benefits. You didn't have to go pay $40, $50, $70 for an office visit copay. I had a broker tell me that $100 copay for a specialist visit. I was like, what? what's the point of having a copay on this? So essentially, these exorbitant high copay amounts, let's get back to where we were before. Let's go back 15 years and turn the clock back, right? And give employees great benefits, lower the lower the employers out of pocket with their spending on their medical on an annual basis. And essentially what we wanna do is that's gap, right? What is it? It's a primary component of your underlying major medical program. What we do with gap, is we ensure deductible and coinsurance as it applies to a major medical program so that we marry up to that major med, the group major med, so that essentially A plus B equals C. You take this horrible B level major medical program that's got high out of pocket expenses, you put our gap plan with it, which is an A level gap program that covers all these out of pocket expenses. And together, you create an overall amazing plan that employees can leave a zero out of pocket expense for them. And while at the same time, the employer is saving money on their health care costs. And that's why we say it's the primary component. Is because what will happen inside your groups is that they are going to value my gap program more than the major. Now, you might think that that is a ridiculous statement. But I am telling you, I started here nine years ago, approximately. The first group that I ever sold met, or I, I got planned to, still with us today. They have switched major medical carriers probably three, four times. They've gotten a couple of rate increases actually from over that eight, nine years. They're still with us. And the reason why they're still with us is because they value their GAT program more than their major. Because once you get to a two, three, four, five, six thousand dollar deductible plan, what is the point of having a major med? Your major med has now become a critical illness policy. If I have a child, if I'm in the hospital, if I'm in intensive care, if I have a heart attack or stroke, sure, that major medical plan is there to cover me so that I don't have to essentially owe $250,000 or half a million dollars for what just occurred. But at the same time, $6,000 to an employee that makes $40,000, $50,000 a year, and out of pocket exposure, to them it might as well only be $250,000. Because sometimes with the loss of wages and the $6,000 bill they're facing, well, I don't have to file bankruptcy anyway. And 
so many bankruptcy or bankruptcies in the United States of America are caused by out-of-pocket expenses due to major medical bills. So what we're trying to do is reimburse that out-of-pocket expense for the employees so that they don't have to worry about that. Again, re taking that fear out of the equation. So what we pay off is the major med EOB. Again, we're married to it. If the major med doesn't cover it, we don't cover it. So you get an elective cosmetic skirt surgery and your major med says, I'm not covering that. Neither are we. And it's, so this is not a fixed indemnity benefit. Like there are programs out there and they have their place in the market that are voluntary, that pay a specific dollar amount. So they might pay $50 per day for hospital confinement. And before you used to see them advertised on television, they'd be talking about paying for your groceries, paying for your rent. Oh, you had an injury or sickness or an hospital, we can help pay for your group. Now, you'll notice that those commercials from that very large name in our industry have flipped. And all of a sudden, they're starting to talk more about, oh, we can help pay for your out-of-pocket major medical expenses. Why is that? Because, again, we'd have to turn back the clocks of time in order to go back to the $250 deductible, $500 deductible plans with $10 co-pays, where that type of fixed indemnity plan could have been very helpful because, yeah, they might have gotten $100 towards their $250 deductible. That would have been helpful. That would have paid their groceries. But nowadays, that's nothing. That's a drop in the bucket when you have a $6,000, $8,000 deductible or out-of-pocket max. So we're paying off that major medical EOB. And what it is, it's a bucket of money. It's fully insured. It's a guaranteed issue. So you don't have to ask any health questions. It's all based off of age. Not even gender, just age of the employee. So essentially, because it's fully insured, because it's guaranteed issue, you don't have to worry about a group getting decline or this group paying more for, you know, this person that. So if you have a 40 year old, working in your office, and I have a 40-year-old working in my office, if they're in the same state with the same exact gap benefit, with the same exact carrier, they're essentially paying the exact same amount. So now I've taken out all of that issue of, oh, okay, having to get individual health questionnaires, underwriting it, and worrying about, is it gonna be overpriced? But that's a great thing about the gap program is that it's fully insured and it's guaranteed issue. Now. It can be voluntary, but I would say that 90 something, I would say 95 percent of our groups are have some type of employer contribution towards them. Most of the groups that we sell are either 100 percent employer paid or if they're contributing 50 percent to the major med, they're contributing 50 percent to the gap. And it's not an app. It's not, again, a voluntary product. What they're doing is they're saying, OK, here's your major med. It has a $5,000 deductible. I know we increased it a lot, but hold on. Here's how it pays. Now, here's your gap program that comes alongside of this. And now it's way better than what you had before. And here's how you access your benefits. Here's how the program works. If you want the gap or if you want the major medical group that comes to the gap, it's you know $100 a month for employee only. Now that $100 of employee only costs, 70 is going to the major med, 30 is coming to me. But essentially, we're getting 100% participation with inside the group. Because if you go out with a voluntary offering, there's a possibility that, you know, you're going to have a very bad renewal because you're signing it up to five people that are the sickest or have health conditions or expecting a child in the next year. We're going to get killed with claims and have, you know, a, a tenth of the premium that we should if we got the whole group. So what the value proposition of GAP is? is that it's a triple win for everyone. The employer is going to save money by electing a lower cost major medical plan that has higher out-of-pocket expenses. The employee is going to win because they can have first dollar coverage now potentially with our GAP program. Even if they have a deductible, you as the employer and the broker are setting that deductible. You want 250, you want 500, you want it to be 1,000, okay. But essentially, you're giving them better benefits or equal to benefits that they had previously. So the employee should be winning. And because we throw in non-insured benefits, which we'll get into at the end of the presentation, 
they're actually getting stuff that they can utilize that will make their plan overall better because they're going to get these value added services out of it as well. And then brokers, you get to be the creative superstar of that group. You had a problem, you had a 20% rate increase. I came in, solved that problem, saved you money, Mr. Employer, made your employees happier than they've ever been before with their medical plan. Oh, and by the way, from the broker's perspective, we pay commissions on the gap. So therefore, you'll make more money on that group by implementing a gap strategy. Normally, you'll increase your commissions anywhere from 10 on the low side, depending on the type of gap plan that you put in, like dollar amount wise, premium amount wise. You'll at least make at least usually 10% more. And normally, brokers make somewhere between 10 to 50% more on those groups. And what smart brokers do is they don't just run and put it in their pocket and they go, yeah, I'm going to go buy myself something nice. What they do is they reinvest it in themselves because now that they've gotten a taste of what they can do with it, what they do is they go out and they, they sell more and more and more and they just start going into groups whose brokers have done nothing except just say, I don't know. You want to do an HSA? You want to do an HRA? Uh, I looked at all the carriers out there. This is, you know. Here's UHC, here's this guy, here's this, I don't know. And what they do is they, they come in with this plan to raise their deductible, save them all kinds of money. They get to be the creative superstar and they win more cases. And then what they do is they invest that money into account management, things that'll help their business grow. Because as your commissions are eroding because you're not selling gap and they're lowering your commissions in the fully insured small group market, your commissions are eroding. I'm making more money. I'm going to be able to hire account managers, which means I'm going to be able to have way better service than you're ever going to have. And essentially now my employer group is going to be so happy with me because every time they call, they're either getting me or my assistant. And now, no issues ever because now I have also OptiMed behind me to make sure this thing runs smooth for me too. I've partnered with a great GAP administrator that has all different kinds of gap options and designs and things to choose from, a million different ways to skin the cat. I'm in a great position. And believe me, there are brokers that I have worked with today that I started working with eight years ago that were like almost one man bands that now have three, four agents working for them, account managers, and it was them a receptionist, and that was about it. And now they have an office of seven, eight, 10 people working for them and they're raking it in. And they will tell you it's all because of GAP. And they're gonna hire more people now because instead of everybody going, I'm retired, I can't, I gotta get out of this, you know, benefits, this is, this, there's no money left in it. Well, guess what? For me, for them, there's plenty of money left in that because the GAP is actually allowing them to make money on these groups. And like I I don't know of any other product in the marketplace, and I've said this on every probably webinar that I've ever done, conversation with a broker if you can tell me another product that can be the triple win like this please let me know about it because i'd love to hear about it because even if you say well you could do an hra yeah okay but it would have to come in better than what the gap premium would have to be so it means no one's going to be able to utilize it right it's not going to have our non-insured benefits to it and there's always going to be that looming question of oh what happens in a bad year Will the employer be able to have enough funds available to fund their HRA account? And two, you're not going to make as much money commission-wise on selling HRAs. You might be able to build in something small as far as a PPM for yourself, but you're not going to make as much commission as far as, as what you would do selling GAP. And an HRA is not going to throw in the non-insured benefits that we offer that are very uh, good non-insured benefits. So. When we come to uh, or talk about the triple win, I think there's no better product out there than the GAP program. And like I said, if you have something, I'd love to hear about it. So what does that mean? We're good groups, right? Good fits for GAP. You got to have groups that care about their employees. It's the most important thing about GAP. If you don't have a group that cares about their employees, then GAP is not going to work for them. And simply put, the reason why is that it's not really meant to be a voluntary product. It can be offered on a voluntary basis, but it's not meant to do that. 
it is not meant to be something as an afterthought. It's again, a concept. You're buying, when you're selling gap, you're buying into a concept. A plus B equals this. I want to be able to save my employer money. I want to be able to give great benefits to the employees. And I want to be able to offer, you know, go back and turn back the time and go back to 15 years ago when there was low deductibles, right? Offering first dollar gap benefits to their employees. So when we talk about that rate increases at renewal, obviously you're looking at a 20% rate increase, you have a $1,500 deductible. What are you going to do? Then you can shop it around, you try to do an HSA, you try to do an HRA. This is a perfect tool where you can keep it with the same exact carrier, raise the deductible up, fill in the hole with the gap, and you're off to the races. First dollar coverage. I want to return to, like I said, I want to turn back the clock and I want to go back to great medical plans that had first dollar coverage. And that's what I want for my employees because I want to attain or retain and attract good employees. So when that, somebody comes into my office and they say, why should I work for you? Well, you're not gonna be able to find better benefits than what we offer. We have a plan where you don't even have to pay out of pocket for anything for your medical expenses. It's like a zero out of pocket expense plan, except for some few co-pays here and there that you might have to put out for. It. It's an amazing plan. Well, if you have somebody who values health insurance and values their medical benefits, that's when they're looking for a job, well, you're gonna be at the top of the list because just think about how much they would have to make more at another company, right? So if you go to another company, they have a $2,000 deductible plan, well, make sure they're gonna pay you $4,000 more annually than what I'm willing to pay it because you're gonna to have to make that in order to cover your deductible every year in case something, God forbid, happens and you need to hit your deductible or you hit your deductible on your medical. So you're in essence going ahead and giving your employees a pay raise when by and by doing this with first dollar coverage and what you see a lot of is in the small group arena that five to 500 where they don't want an hra because of that exact reason of fluctuation in the hra i don't want to have to come up with the money if necessary i'm worried very worried about the fact that i might have to fund my hra one month and i'm not going to have the money to do it because i get hit all at once so we take that fear out of the equation. And the way we take the fear out of the equation is that it's premium, it's fully insured. There is no funding. So now, because there is no funding, we can go ahead and just say, here's your bill. Here's your list bill. George is gonna cost you $50 a month for employee only. So now you've accomplished an HRA for a small group. You don't have to find an administrator. You don't have to do this. You don't have to come up with swipe cards, pay for swipe cards, none of that stuff. All you have to do is just implement a gap strategy and pay the premium every month that's on your list bill, just like the major medical. And what you can also do is use this as steerage to a uh, HSA plan design. Because an HSA plan design is a plan design that no one really likes as far as employees are concerned. Unless, like I said, you're that engineering firm maybe that, uh, you know, has a lot of high paid employees that can fund their HSA account, have the disposable income, for lack of a better word, to pay for that. So I think that fear out of the equation, right? Because we can go in with an HSA plan design and we can do one of two things. We can either A, do first dollar coverage, and it's a health savings plan design without a health savings account, or B, we can make it HSA compatible by adding a $1,400 gap deductible. So we as a gap company won't add or won't pay, I'm sorry, any benefits until the $1,400 deductible of ours has been met. So what you would do is you would take a you know $6,900 out of pocket HSA plan. We would put a $1,400 deductible on it and essentially we would have a $5,500 back-end benefit so that you're gonna pay the first 1,400 using your health savings account, and then we're gonna gap the back and we're gonna pay the extra 5,500. So any given year, you as an employee only have to worry about paying for 
$1,400, unless it's some exclusion, which we'll get into one of the exclusions, but there's like one or two. Um, so since there's only one or two, 95 to 99% of the employees are not gonna have to worry about hitting one of those exclusions. Now, what forward thinking brokers will do is even if you don't get a rate increase, let's say you get a flat renewal. Yes, you can run in there, say, sign here, it's flat, and run right back out. You want to keep everything the same? Great, here you go. Sign here and go. Or B, you could say, okay, got a flat renewal. You good with that? Yeah, but here's what I think you should do. You have a $1,500 deductible plan now. I found this plan. It's got a $2,000 deductible, but I want to put this gap plan in there. And I don't care if it really saves them a whole lot of money or, you know, as long as it keeps them around the road of the same amount of spend, right? Essentially, what you're doing with that is that by putting in that $500 gap program, you're getting them used to the two-card system. And when we talk about accessing your benefits, essentially, that's what we're talking about is the two-card system, which we'll get into. You're getting them used to gap so that maybe not this year, but the following year or the year after that, when they get hit with a 20% rate increase, guess what's going to happen? All you're going to do is go in and say, hey, bad news, good news, bad news. Hey, sorry, 20% rate increase. But good news, we're just going to take it from that $2,000 deductible, you know, I signed up for last year. We're just going to take that to five. And uh, the employer's going to go, oh, what? But don't worry about it. We're going to take that $500 benefit that we put last year with you. I'm just going to increase that to $2,500. And combined, this is what your new premium would be, which takes you down from that 20% rate increase down to like maybe two or negative one or five, whatever, makes it better, more palatable. So you've prepared yourself, and now employees who have been used to using this two-card system for the last year or so, all you have to do is walk into the employee meeting, like, yeah, you know the gap benefits? Yeah, well, we raised the deductible on the major med, but we increased your gap benefits to match. So you still have the same out-of-pocket. Only now, because the gap plan is first dollar, you don't have to worry, because now if you even spend more, you're not gonna hit. So yeah, before you had a $500 benefit, now you have a $2,500 benefit. So as long as you don't go over $2,500 and spend, I get, you won't owe a dime. And that's why I like first dollar benefits because it rewards both high utilizer and low utilizer. Because low utilizers who maybe just need a couple tests every you know year, lab tests, whatever, they'll actually see the benefit of the GAP program. But so with a high utilizer. And by putting uh, the benefits in the front end and maybe leaving back an exposure, so if you have a $5,000 deductible, you know, maybe you put a $3,000 first dollar benefit in there, leaving it back into two. Well, what have you done? You've rewarded people that essentially don't spend more than $3,000 annually, and you're punishing people that go over that, and that really punishing, but you're making them have skin in the game. You have them have $2,000 of back end exposure. So now high utilizers are not necessarily punished, but have more skin in the game, pay more for their actual, uh, you know, out-of-pocket expenses for their for the, the, the medical expenses they're incurring. So the plan designs and options, there's two types of gap plans. There's a two bucket and then there's a one bucket. The two bucket has two benefits. There is an inpatient benefit and there is an outpatient benefit. The inpatient benefit is gonna cover accident, sickness, or hospital confinement. So maternity, I had a heart attack, I'm in the ICU. Essentially those gap, uh, that gap inpatient benefit's gonna cover that. The outpatient benefit, right, is gonna cover outpatient services, such as lab, surgeries, emergency room, urgent care, durable medical equipment, physical therapy. Essentially, the rule of the gap is as long as it's an eligible expense under the major medical plan, and as long as you're going to a licensed facility, the gap is going to pay. And whether the gap pays out of the, uh, you know, the inpatient bucket or the outpatient bucket is determined by, well, did you go for an outpatient service or did you go for an inpatient service? Um, and depending on what you did, We'll pay out of either bucket. Now, normally the outpatient benefit and the inpatient benefit, the outpatient is usually half or 70% of the end. So for example, if you have a $5,000 inpatient benefit, 
that would normally come with a $2,500 outpatient benefit. But some of our GAP carriers, you can go up to a $3,500 outpatient benefit. Some of them you can go down. So where you get to a $5,000 inpatient with a $1,000 out. And essentially those are employers that say, you know what? I do want to protect in case somebody has a heart attack or has an attorney. I don't want them to owe five grand because we have this $5,000 deductible. So I'll put that in there. But outpatient services, you know, they should have way more skin in the game. I don't want them to be able to use outpatient services are huge drivers of medical costs and, the and uh, you know, are part of my pain of why I'm getting rate increases, I believe. So, yeah, I'll reimburse them that first thousand. But after that, they're on their own. They're going to have a $4,000 back end of exposure. That's fine. You can do that as well. Now, you also have, you know, with a two bucket approach, um, the ability, like I said, to go up past the 50% mark or down past the 50% mark. It's really, there's no right or wrong. It's whatever the employer and you as the broker are consulting them on. What are their concerns? What are their needs? What are they looking to do? But that's why in the previous slide, I said, it's, they got to care. Like, yeah, I want better benefits for my employee, whether that's better inpatient benefits or outpatient benefits or both or overall, that's for you to consult with your employer group on. But when the one bucket approach, there is no inpatient and outpatient benefit. It's just one single benefit. So instead of a 5,000 and a 2,500 bucket, it's one bucket of 5,000. And whether it's an inpatient claim or it's an outpatient claim, it's being paid out of that $5,000. So all those same things, hospital, x-ray, lab, surgery, urgent care, durable equipment, physical therapy, all those things are still being covered. It's just that they're being paid out of one bucket instead of two. Now, the reason why you'll see that, you know, single buckets are sometimes more expensive is because you're looking at a 5,000, 2,500, where the carrier's exposure is, where we see most of the claims are for outpatient claims and they're smaller claims. Or they're like, you know, an all emergency room visit that costs a couple thousand bucks a surgery, but normally on outpatient cases that are higher. But normally we get a lot of claims for simple labs that cost 52, you know, office visits that cost a hundred dollars. Those are most of the claims that we get whacked. Um, so as you increase the outpatient benefit, right? A 5,000 single bucket means they have 5,000 of inpatient benefit, but they also have 5,000 of outpatient. That's one single bucket, but they can actually go up to $5,000 of outpatient benefit without hitting their cap. Unlike the double bucket, even though it's separate benefits, you can get hospitalized and, you know, or, you know, essentially get $3,000 taken out of your inpatient benefit, then go for an outpatient service after your, you know, hospitalization. And all of a sudden now, you know, you have a claim for a hundred dollar office visit. We would be paying that out of your outpatient benefit. So there, again, there's no right or wrong to, the inpatient out or the double bucket single bucket approach again it's what are you trying to accomplish now the single bucket is easier to explain to an employer group and that's why we probably sell more single bucket than we do double bucket by a lot um and it's because it's just easier to explain uh you can add deductibles to this stuff um and we'll go over the features but when we talk about exclusions right here's your list of exclusions so essentially you have home health care. And why can't we cover home health care? Because it's not being performed at a licensed facility. Again, eligible expense under the major medical plan must be done at a licensed facility. Home health care is being performed at the home, so we can never cover home health care. But we're talking about group major medical. If they're working, they're not at home. So it might be a dependent of an employee that might have a home health care claim. You rarely see them. I, I, I've been working here, like like I said, almost nine years. I've never had a broker call me up and say, oh, yeah, I got a problem. They had a home health care claim, and, you know, the employee's not happy. Like, it hasn't happened to me. Um, prescription drug copays, you never cover an, a, a script copay. We can't cover specialty drugs. We can't cover skilled nursing. Now, skilled nursing normally doesn't come into play very much. Because with skilled nursing, you have to go ahead and have a uh, three-day hospital stay normally in order to be confined to a skilled nursing facility. 
So even if you have an 8150 out of pocket maximum, if you can go to a hospital and have a three day stay and not wind up with an 8150 bill, and you're probably one of the cheapest hospitals in the United States of America, more than likely you're gonna eat all of your out of pocket expense with the hospital claim, which means we're gonna exhaust any benefits that we have inpatient wise. You know, if it's double bucket or the single bucket is gonna be exhausted anyway. So we wouldn't have paid anything to the school nursing facility because the major meds probably picking it up at 100%. So again, we're not really run into issues with that, but it is an exclusion that we want you to make, you know, be aware of. There's obviously other exclusions like boilerplate exclusions. Like if it's a workman's comp claim, we're not handling it because it's not being handled through the major med. You know, acts of war. Uh, you would want to take a look at the policy. When you get a quote, you notice in the policy, you want to take a look at the policy to see the limitations and exclusions of the plans. Um, to get a feel of what isn't covered. But like I said before, when we talk, I, you know, I said before that we have gap plans that are A gap plans. I can't tell you how many people in the industry look at gap and have to deal with things like, um, you know, out of pot or uh, gap plans that don't cover uh, things like cancer that won't cover emergency room visits unless your hospital can find. So what's the point? Um, don't cover a lot of outpatient surgery. Won't cover an outpatient surgery. Won't cover things at a doctor's office. Oh, you had your surgery performed at a doctor's office. You had your you know, mole removal done at your dermatologist. Well, we're not covering the mole removal, nor are we covering the dermatologist fees. Because we don't cover professional fees of a, a doctor. So that's what I'm saying. What is the point of then having the gap? Again, we want this to act like an HRA MS without a swipe card just a gap card, which we'll talk about in a second on how to access your benefits. So, but you wanna take a look at the policy limitations and exclusions page. Now on there, you might see some of these things. These are riders. So I might say, oh, these things are excluded, but we have riders that can eliminate those exclusions. So don't freak out if you get a proposal from us and you see the policy and it says that we don't cover things pertaining to office visits. We can, we can eliminate that exclusion with a rider. So we can do first dollar for upfront deductibles. The deductible amounts usually start at 250 and they can go up to as high as like I think three, four thousand dollars on most of our carriers. Um, so it's up to again, however you want to do it. I knew in the past before the ACA, I'd see like plans in certain states where they'd have a ten thousand dollar deductible where the broker would go in and put a three thousand dollar deductible up front on a gap plan and have a $7,000 benefit on the back to cover the back. So you could do something similar, you know, our out of pocket maxes on most plans are 8150 now. So, but you could do something similar in the sense that you could go to an 8150 deductible plan and, you know, have a $3,000 deductible in the front with like a, you know, 5150 benefit on the back end. Whatever you want to do. Now, when it comes to office visit coverage, there's two ways we can cover an office visit. The first way we can cover it is if you have an HDHP or HSA plan design and that office visit's gonna be subjected to deductible, we can cover it out of the outpatient benefit on a double bucket gap or under the single benefit if it's a single bucket gap. So for example, I'm on an HDHP plan. I go to my doctor's office. He's a primary or specialist, it doesn't matter. After the visit, I pay nothing because I don't have a copay. An EOB shows up and I owe $100. That $100 is eligible under the gap plan. So if you had a 5,2500, we would take it out of the $2,500 benefit on your outpatient, and now you'd be left with $2,400. It's single bucket, you'd be taken out of the five, and you'd have 4,900 left in benefit. So that's one way we can cover office visits. The other way, if there is a copay and it's not subjected to deductible, then we have fixed indemnity benefits that we can add to pay, for example, $30 per visit up to eight visits a year or 10 visits a year or $50 per five visits, whatever. Um, when you do that, that's for the, whether it's single or family, they're normally the same. So it doesn't matter if you're family coverage or if you're single, you get five visits, $50. And because providers don't care about filing claims for your copay, you're always gonna to have to submit those to us. 
So the employee is going to have to submit that claim in order for reimbursement. Whereas in that situation where it's an ACHP plan, when they hand in both their cards to the provider, the provider should bill us, leaving the employee not have to do anything because once the provider bills the major medical company and they see that it's a $100 bill and it was subjected to deductible, they're going to come bill to us next. And when they bill to us next, we're going to pay that. So therefore, the employee didn't have to do anything and they owe no money. And that's why I would suggest marrying our gap plans up to HDHP plans because good utilizers that just go to the doctors once a year, twice a year, because maybe they get sick, guess what? They're going to benefit just like the high utilizers because they're not going to have to pay a copay each. So you can make it HSA compatible with a $1,400 deductible or more. You can add prescription drug coverage. Now, prescription drug coverage, we can cover generic and brand if it's deductible, an HSA plan. Very easy slide, we said no RX copays. So we can't cover copays and we can't cover specialty drugs. Mental health substance abuse, we can either cover it or not in most states. Sometimes we have to cover it in certain states. State availability, Connecticut, Mon Minnesota, Montana, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey, Washington, there's no gap available. And this goes by the site of state. We need five enrolled in order to write in most states and ages or rates are based off of age, like I said before. Groups under 20, you have to go age banded, under 40 to 49 over 50, or under 40, 40 to 49 over 50. You can composite rate groups of over 20. And can be voluntary, like I talked about before, but we don't recommend doing it that way. And you can do enrollment via census or by paper if you wanna do a paper. Now, accessing your gap benefits, um, what I'm going to do is on our website, uh, there is a uh, video and what that video is, is a video of uh, what we call accessing your gap benefits. And it's under the broker tab. If you ever go to our website, I'm going to play it for you now just on the, the presentation itself. Um, but. What this allows us uh, to do is to uh, kind of explain the two card system. And it's really the thing that I found really explains it well. So I'll go ahead and play that for you now. Hello, and welcome to the Optimus Bank. This video was designed to help explain how your Optimus Bank plan works and how to access your gap benefits. So let's begin. Your employer has purchased two insurance programs that work together to provide a great overall medical plan. The first plan is your major medical plan. Your major medical plan is comprehensive, but the one drawback is the out-of-pocket expenses for you and your dependents. These out-of-pocket expenses include things like deductibles, co-insurance, and co -pay. The second plan is your Optimus Gap Plan. Your Optimus Gap Plan is designed to reimburse some of those major medical out-of-pocket expenses. That includes your deductible, co-insurance, and certain co -pays. So, 1 plus 2 equals great medical coverage. Your major medical plan is there to cover you comprehensively, and the Optimus Gap Plan is there to reimburse some of those major medical out-of-pocket expenses. You should review your Optimed policy particulars, the benefit amounts, and see any exclusions and limitations of the Optimed gap plan. Your certificate will be available after you and your employer group are enrolled in the Optimed gap plan. Next question is, well, how does this gap plan work? The great news is that Optimed has made it very simple and easy to access your gap benefits. Once enrolled, you'll be issued an Optimed gap card which you should carry along with your major medical insurance plan card. When receiving medical care, whether at a hospital, lab facility, doctor's office, or other medical facility, present both cards to the provider. Your provider won't know you have the Optimed Gap Plan unless you present the card to them. In most cases, your provider will bill Optimed, leaving you no further action to take. Your provider is not required to bill Optimed. So, in the event your provider will not bill Optimed, you can file your claim with Optimed directly. Log on to OptimedHealth.com. In the top navigational menu, go Member, and then scroll down to Claim. 
you'll first receive instructions on how to file your claim. You will need certain documents, such as explanation of benefits of your major medical care. This form is sometimes mailed to you by your major medical care, or can be accessed online at your carrier's website. Questions about filing your claim online or need assistance, or have questions about the plan, please do not hesitate to call us. Our phone number is 800 482 Once Optimed processes your claim, we will then issue a benefit payment up to your benefit maximum for any eligible expenses that apply to your underlying major medical plan. If your provider bills Optimed, we will issue that payment to the provider. With Optimed Gas, you won't lose sleep worrying about out of pocket medical expenses. If you have any questions about your Optimed Gas plan, please go to our website, www.optimedhealth.com, or call us at 800 482 so that's our gap uh, video uh, that we use uh, and that essentially can be used for enrollment purposes um, and showing employees how to be able to access their benefits and like I said that is on our uh, website optimedhealth.com and under the broker tab it'll say gap group gap orientation video so as the video stated it's very simple it's very easy to get your gap benefits now there's other and we're going to finish this up with the other non value or non-insured benefits that we offer that i spoke about um you're talking about telephonic doctor office visits now great thing about this no copay the employee can use it as much as they want and it's free for them to use so they get unlimited telephonic doctor office visit with nothing out of their pocket, which in today, obviously, as we're experiencing coronavirus, would have been every person that has our GAP, limited med, MEC, or level funded major medical product right now has been enjoying the ability to not have to pay a copay if they wanted to use telemedicine. Uh, there's an employee assistance program, there's patient advocacy, there's wellness nurse line and a workplace wellness. And we, like I said, do the COBRA on the GAP, we just don't do uh, COBRA on other lines without an additional charge. But we can do it if you like. This is all of our contact information. I'll leave the screen up uh, while I answer questions that uh, people may have typed into the uh, question box. Uh, Yeah, the, the slides will be available um, for uh, people to go ahead and if you want, email myself, Tony, Rob, uh, whoever sent you the uh, handout, the, uh, the webinar invite, go ahead and just email them and uh, we'll go ahead and we'll email it out to you. Um, if you know, uh, yeah. Essentially, the question is, if we don't get a bill from the provider, how do we know what to pay? Essentially, are we just strictly going off the explanation of benefits? And that is correct. We are strictly just going off of the out of uh, out of uh, the uh, explanation of benefits uh, that the uh, major medical plan has supplied to us. Um, we'll pay the provider directly if they submit the claim to us. We'll pay the employee directly if they file the claim to us. So whoever files the claim uh is going is who we're going to pay the the benefits to uh let's see if you pair this with an hsa qualified plan can the employee still fund an hsa yes as long as we have a fourteen hundred dollar deductible on the gap plan itself uh Yes, the outpatient benefits include physician visit costs. It doesn't automatically come with it. So you have to ask if you want the, the charge of the office visit itself to be covered, you have to let us know like, yeah, I have an HDHP plan. I, that's what I'm gonna marry it up to. So I wanna cover office visits or I have a copay and I want this copay to be covered um, at $20 a visit and I want 10 visits. But the Whatchamacallit, the actual um, 
like the uh, charges them or the actual things happening in the doctor's office. So, so let's say, for example, it's a lab or a surgery. That's automatically covered. Yes, you don't have to worry about those things. Um, okay, so when clients have like three or four plans now that have generally higher deductibles already and HSA plans, you find that your GAP solution works well. It depends. I mean, it really depends on spread. Um, can you find the spread between, right, going from this to that? And in those scenarios, maybe you go with a voluntary product or maybe if the employer is contributing something to the health savings account use that to buy gap so it's not going to be a great fit like gap is not a fit for every single group if you can't find premium spread meaning by moving from a one thousand dollar deductible to a five thousand dollar deductible if that's saving you 20 bucks a month on the employee only rate <laughs> that's not going to work but if you can save like a hundred dollars yeah that'll definitely work so it's just a matter of how much money are you saving. So we can take a look at it and see, but if there's not really like a low plan option out of four, like if it's an HSA plan and then there's like a $6,000 a four to three, eh. but if they have a low plan, like a $1,000 deductible plan, yeah, instead of offering four plans, you could go with one, pl two plans, like the HSA, and you could go with the $6,000 deductible and gap the other two to make it look like, the, you know, the ones previously, and hopefully that saves premium. Um, and I think that's the last question. So I'd like to again thank everyone for attending the presentation today. If you have any questions, you want the slides, uh, some people already asked for it, I can get them over to you, uh, or Tony or Rob will, um, and we'll send you over the recording of the gap plan that you can play. Uh, and we also have things posted on our website as far as brochures, literature, it's all under the broker tab. Um, so again, thanks everyone for attending. I appreciate everyone taking the time to learn about our products today. And look out for other webinar invites on things like our level funded programs, MAC, Limited Medical. We're gonna do an overall product one very soon. So once you get those invitations, hopefully you can join us for those as well. So have a great day and uh, stay safe out there. Bye.